Good afternoon, everyone, to this uh, final plenary uh, talk of the conference. We'll just wait a couple of minutes till everyone had the opportunity to join. All right, I think if people come in late, they can still join. So let's start on time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, um, welcome everyone to the uh, final uh, plenary session. Um, I don't have a housekeeping slide, uh, but I guess if you've attended the conference, you're familiar with the procedure. Uh, if you have any questions, then you can use the question and answer uh, uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And um, we will try to answer all these questions in the end. We may not be able to go through all of them. Um, so, but, but please uh, uh, pose your questions there and uh, you can also vote there. If you like particular questions and you vote for them, they come to the top. All right, so um, it is my greatest pleasure <clears throat> to introduce to you today's plenary speaker, Professor Patrick Reed. Patrick is head of the Decision Analytics for Complex Systems Research Group at Cornell University. Uh, when we thought about the perfect plenary speaker for this conference, we decided that they should appeal to academics as well as practitioners uh, and to hard OR people as well as soft OR people. <clears throat> While this seems almost imp <clears throat> impossible to bridge, I believe today's speaker is one of the very few able to do so. Patrick is an academic working with hard OR techniques such as metaheuristics, artificial intelligence, uncertainty quantification and simulation. And he's applying these techniques on large, complex, real world decision problems. So he deals with multiple stakeholders, conflicting objectives and huge uncertainties. Patrick has published over a hundred papers in top journals and has won numerous awards, such as, for example, the Yumi's Award for Human Competitive Results in Evolutionary Computation, or the Paul Witherspoon Award for Advances in Hydrologic Sciences. The software developed by him and his team is used by more than 30,000 people worldwide. Last but not least, Patrick is also an excellent speaker. I still remember the first time I met him a number of years ago when we, were, when we were actually both plenary speakers at the same conference. He gave a brilliant lecture, which left me wondering whether my own lecture would live up to the high standards that he had set. And I'm very glad that he agreed to talk to us today on conflict, coordination and control. Do we understand the actual rules used to balance flooding, energy and uh, agricultural trade-offs. Uh, so Patrick, over to you. Thank you very much and good afternoon. And in monitoring sort of the diversity and uh, the exciting uh, program, um, it's, it's a pleasure to, to meet with you and hopefully I can engage you. Obviously you've had a few days of uh, significant, um, I would say time spent interacting on some technical material. And I want to thank Jurgen for the invitation. And uh, it's humbling for, to hear him say that because I had the same reaction to his plenary talk as he described for mine. Uh, a few things here up front. I want to acknowledge, so the work I'm about to share with you, uh, 
Uh, Julianne Quinn was my uh, former PhD, who's now a junior faculty at the University of Virginia. And this represents approximately six years of collaborative work uh, with Politecnico de Milano, my specific collaborators, Matteo Giuliani and Andrea Castelletti. And I'd like to highlight that the Italian Foreign Ministry coordinated with the ministries in Vietnam, and specifically uh, from the European side, Matteo and Andrea were awarded the European Commission's Award for Responsible Research and Innovation for this work. So I wanna give them strong credit for what I'm about to share with you. Stepping back a little bit uh, from the specific case of Vietnam, but more general. So if we think about socio-environmental systems and the criticality often of these problems where they are also defined by their ambiguity, potential contention and perspective, and even the definition of the problems themselves, not necessarily uh, clear. One of the things that concerns me, and this is from the New York Times, and this is from the US, and actually you could almost do this on a week by week basis. But this idea of fight to tame a swelling river with dams that may be outmatched by climate change. So the person who's being interviewed here is John Remus is actually the operator of these reservoirs. There's 20 million people that actually all throughout the central and southern United States to depend on this cascade of reservoirs. And folks like John Remus do not necessarily make public statements that often to the New York Times. And it's pretty direct here. Uh, there's not a lot of ambiguity in his message. It was not designed to handle this. And this is from a, a Derrico actual climate event um, that actually took some towns off the map of the United States. The reason I wanna step back here is although I'm putting the socio-environmental context of Vietnam sort of at the forefront for my talk, you can see these stories emerging uh, globally. And one of the things that we have to think about is sort of as we do our science, how do we have the credibility, the relevance to these systems and the legitimacy to sort of engage with problems at this scale? And I would say that a few things that are coming is that we should think about the way that we're using model-based understanding. And I'm using model-based here, not just mathematical modeling, but also simulation-driven. So in a lot of these social environmental systems, the simulation model is something that may pre-exist and is a significant boundary object in terms of the, the view of what the system's actually doing. And then if we think about risk and resilience, we have to be able to capture the extremes and the real failure modes. So, the way that we often decompose problems or from an academic perspective, something that's elegant may actually in fact be dangerous in these systems. Uh, and sometimes you can't escape the specific details. And in specific details, thinking about how often do we actually capture the real failure modes in these systems. And then one of the other interesting thing from a socio-environmental systems perspective, you have this coupled human natural system collaborative effect and although for, I think, the participants of this conference, human preferences being important is probably not controversial, as you navigate these problems, you might be surprised at how often it is surprising to natural scientists in particular that human preferences are fundamental. And if we think about the trade-offs and the conflicting demands on these types of systems and really needing to get in and understanding in high fidelity what the actions are to manage them, um, that's stressing our ability to simulate and understand this. And so ultimately in our work, in the example I'm about to share, what we've been doing is trying to create uh, computational state action consequence feedbacks, an exploratory modeling approach where you can get in and you can look at the system across many worlds and sort of classify the combination of actions and consequences that so if we move to the Red River Basin, second largest river basin in Vietnam, and in terms of uh, the overall importance economically, the capital city of Hanoi is in the Delta and it has existential threats from monsoonal flooding. So the monsoonal flooding and in general, um, the flooding has an average of about $130 million US across the Delta 
and $50 million, so this is per year, average annual. So these large flooding risks actually motivated the multi-billion dollar investment in major storages. So you see Hanoi here, and then the largest reservoir is shown in the image, Hoi Bin, and then that's in series with Son La, and then a smaller reservoir, Thak Ba, and then Tun K. So you have this multi-billion dollar investment so building these in this complex system where you have uh, the Asian monsoon and uh, multi-sector demands becomes actually quite challenging. And so the initiation of our project, uh, Polytechnica de Milano reached out to Cornell to help think about how the coordination and control of these reservoirs uh, could be advanced in collaboration with the ministries in Vietnam. To set some context, the dams provide 46% of Vietnam's total installed electric power capacity. It is not an open market, so there's fixed pricing. Uh, that's potentially likely to change as natural gas and some of the other components in the neighboring countries open up. But at the stage of this analysis, it was a fixed market. And the reservoirs provide reliable water supply for 70% of the Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese population. Uh, and agriculture is critical to that. And 76% of that sector is irrigated water. And you see here the, the mix of different components. And in this specific system, uh, this is the third largest rice production zone in Asia. And so when we're thinking about this, you have a strong change. So you have in Vietnam a very young and dynamic actually country. There was a tremendous transition. You have rapidly growing population. You have a service sector that's transforming. It's transitioning and actually the investments in education, technology and uh, strategic um, investment in the manufacturing sector uh, and industrial sector is shifting the country out of agriculture, although it's still significantly important, but you have this context where the human system is changing rapidly. The other thing is that situation normal in this system is not normal. So over the last decade, they've been fluctuating between extreme flood and extreme drought. Um, so an average year hasn't actually been occurring. Um, and if we think about that, and within the context of what we're trying to do with the system, so we're trying to find operations that maximize hydropower production, and we did this collaboratively. Uh, our Italian colleagues were the lead in terms of in-the-room um, facilitation and elicitation with the ministries of uh, Vietnam. And then we want to minimize the water supply deficit for agriculture, so you basically want to store that water for summer drought season, and you want to, to meet those needs. And then the core driver is minimized flooding at Hanoi, which is an existential threat. So if we think about this, this is a strongly uncertain situation. Um, it's challenging to simulate deep uncertainties in the sense that often there's not real well-defined ways that we think about how the system might change, both on the natural and human side. But one of the things is the quantitative effects of translating these potential narrative goals into our models, simulating this out, putting the system in multiple futures and getting some uh, definable control uh, out of this. One of the interesting aspects of this study is that we built enough uh, of a connection and trust with the Vietnamese government that they actually gave us uh, um, the real operating guide. So what they ran, it was C code, you can think of it as greater than a thousand lines. And what did they do? In that C code, they decomposed the system in a way that makes sense. Your wet season, your dry season, and then discretionary um, operation of the reservoirs between this. And just to orient, you can think of this, even if you're not a hydrologist, you can think of each of these inflow rivers as a, a very complex stochastic process where you're worried about the extremes on both ends, so no water and too much water. Uh, their extreme value distribution, they're poorly characterized by historical observations. And then you have the four control points in terms of the reservoirs, uh, 
And then likewise, as we get down here, we have a hydraulic control point where you do not want to breach uh, the levee system in Hanoi and cause catastrophic flooding. And so if we think about the rule systems, the rule systems are a thousand line plus code of if then else types of statements. And if we think about this, they were actually fairly novel. They tried to condition the rule systems on a variety of state variables and contextual inputs for the system. So these if else statements in terms of determining the releases at Son La, thinking about what time period it was. And just to give you a sense of the decision problem, you're talking about hour, hourly releases um, at the, across all days of the year. And so as you're thinking about this, this is quite a large control problem. And so when you're thinking about the, the time of the day and time of the year, think about the current storage in each of the other reservoirs outside of Son La and the current reservoir. And this is a communication or a form of coordination in terms of the state variable. And then a forecast, a 48 hour forecast of what the level from the current operation would be at Hanoi. So you have this mix of information coordinated and a forecast. Likewise, you go down to White Bend. So what have they done? They decomposed across. We're thinking about flood season control you have these different states, and again, this is very similar to the, the prior case, and then you move through the cascade of reservoirs. Uh, so they've decomposed across the reservoirs and they've decomposed uh, across the seasons. As you can think of, it's slightly different in dry season. What do you wanna do? You wanna raise your levels and you wanna hold in your wet periods so you can hold that water and then release that water later in the year. And you have sort of minimum conditions where your releases here, for example, are zero. And then when you meet that, then you have minimal releases that you meet. And this ties into ecological concerns, ties into a, a variety of complex things. So uh, not to lose you in terms of this, but you can see again in the dry season, they go through the cascade. And then one of the interesting things is when in between seasons, it was discretion. So in this, they allow the human operators discretion um, and the interesting thing is, it's not always necessarily clear what is between seasons, uh, particularly as you have a changing potential climate and shifts in the demand. But a key take home point is this decomposition. So wet, dry, and then going one reservoir at a time. And these if then else statements are strongly nonlinear state driven rules. Now we proposed a slightly different approach to this. You can see this, we call it evolutionary multi-objective direct policy search. This is, uh, can be seen if you wanna use reinforcement learning terminology as a, a model-free Monte Carlo uh, form of reinforcement learning where you're doing policy approximation. So in this, what we're doing is instead of optimizing every single hour's release for every simulated year, we actually are formulating a structural policy. So you get the inputs, and then those inputs in this policy give a recommended release. And so this is a simulation-driven, multi-objective, stochastic uh, form of control. And so as we do this, you get your stochastic inflow series, you have your initial population of parameterizing your policies, and then you simulate that through, and then you compute your objectives, via the simulation that we have for the system. So each function evaluation for this consisted of a stochastic thousand year Monte Carlo simulation where you're doing hourly uh, releases for all reservoirs. So four reservoirs across the state, hourly releases across a thousand years. And then we did the optimization uh, for the Cornell side of this, the stochastic simulation optimization, we want to move this policy to approximate Pareto optimality and find our optimal trade-offs across our core objectives. And we were running this in a massively parallel system that ranged uh, between 30,000 and 50,000 core to make the search feasible. So now we have this Red River system. You have these stochastic complex river inputs uh, the mix of releases across your four reservoirs. And you want to actually in this to have a counterfactual example that is as close uh, 
to the original rule systems in terms of inputs as possible. So the way that we did this is that we use radial basis functions, so Gaussian radial basis functions, and we wanted to use the same inputs as the if-then-else rules that were being used by the ministry. And so in this case, what we're doing is we're parameterizing the release strategy. The outputs that you have are the releases at each of your reservoir at hourly scale. Uh, the inputs are the same as those inputs for the original rule, and this is just a way that we actually corrected for end-of-year effects, so there wasn't a, a discontinuity in the mass balance between simulated years. And then the decision variables reduced down to how we actually parameterize. What is the shape of this family of control policies where we give a certain set of inputs and then we get an output mapping? This would run very similarly to theirs, so they're running something that's a C code of a thousand plus lines. And in that regard, what we've done is we've reduced it to these optimization to get a similar analog policy. So in this, we didn't make the same decomposition uh, assumptions as they did, but we uh, tried to match their inputs as much as possible. So if we think about how do these compare, if we think about in this case, this is the level, so proximity, uh, where you, they want to stay below 11.2.5 meters at Hanoi. And anything above this, you're starting to approach breach and flooding of Hanoi. And likewise, in this particular case, so you want to minimize, you want to go this direction towards ideal. You want to maximize your hydropower and you want to minimize the agricultural deficit. So a small blue point here would be ideal. This represents the optimized EMO DPS policies. This actually represents our simulation of the guidelines. One of the challenges of the simulation for the guidelines was the discretionary periods. So what we did in the discretionary periods is we substituted every one of these solutions into the actual guidelines, and this is the distribution that you get. And they want to protect at a 100-year flood. So in a classical statistical stationary sense, that 1% flood event. And what you see here is that they're teetering right on the edge of failure, their definition of failure. So they're balanced on a needle. So as we progress through the rest of the talk, one of the things that we can do is we can compare different potential solutions and how they behave. So we can have a emphasized flooding, we could emphasize hydropower generation. We could have a compromise preference that we represent here in solution C. And then we can take, in this sense, is G as an optimal representation of the guidelines. One of the things that we could do is an ex post analysis. So what we did is we put, in this case, what you're looking at is the compromise solution from the EMO DPS, and we're comparing that to the guideline policy. And we put that in 1,000, 100,000 simulated states of the world. And what you see here as you move from blue to red is the probability density in any given period of being in this part of your state space. And this is the level at Hanoi. And this is your total storage. And you would like to coordinate your storage as much as possible. And anytime you build physical infrastructure like this, there's going to be limits on what it can do. And just to highlight a few points, this is the first alarm for nuisance flooding. This is actually uh, the design where they define failure. So anything above this is considered design failure. And then as you get to the solid black line, this is actually breach at Hanoi. And anytime you design systems like this, you're going to have residual risks. There's going to be limits of that. But one of the things to just highlight here is this fact that on this side, you see that there's this coordination, but you don't get this sort of jump of early thresholds. And in this case, the take home point from this is that if then else structure has this inadvertent effect, where actually, where you're using substantially less than your whole capacity for controlling the system, and you're getting very, very close to failure. So that sort of helps explain the initial sense of why this is systems dangerously on the edge. So the guidelines aren't coordinating operations well. And part of this is sort of to narrate that story of sort of why. And you can think of this from a safe operating space 
So if we think about this and we take this because the system's going to experience conditions that have not been observed, one of the things that we can do is an exploratory modeling of potential changes in the human demands and or the monsoonal extremes. In this, just briefly to give a, a sense of that, this exploratory modeling, we can take the solutions that we have generated and the guidelines that the Vietnamese government is using to control their system. And then we can sample over a broad range of hydrologic and socioeconomic conditions or futures. You can think of this as uh, thousands of Monte Carlo worlds, and then a posteriori sort of judge where success and failure resides in the uncertainty space of the system. So in doing this analysis, we varied seven hydrologic factors that affect basically our representation of the statistics of monsoon and the stochastic processes and extremes. And that includes a mix of mean and variability factors. And then we had four socioeconomic factors includes demands and other allocative. Just to give a sense of this, this is one of the river systems. And what you're looking at is a cumulative distribution, basically. So this is the probability of exceedance. And if we think about Dow River flow, this is where droughts live. And this is where floods live. And this band is basically the distribution of flows over the observed record. So you can think of this as mapping the cumulative distribution of 80 years. Now, one of the things that we've done is we sampled beyond that base case. And if we shift the mean or shift the variance in the process, you can see that that changes that distribution, either increasing or decreasing it. So the point here is that we're changing the statistics. Not with the intent to say that these are the known statistics, but to do an exploratory broad box sampling where we classify how far the system can go before you get into a failure space. We did a similar thing in terms of shifting demands across a variety of concerns, agriculture, aquaculture, et cetera. We shifted these both in terms of their timing and magnitude. And so when we do this joint experiment, you can consider each point on this plot is a Monte Carlo world and it's red or a failure if it didn't meet this condition for flood failures. So less than 2.15. So you're not necessarily below your freeboard where your factor of safety where you don't want flooding in Hanoi. We can compare, this is the best flood solution from the EMO DPS framework and these are the guidelines. Um, and what you're seeing here is shifts in the stochastic uh, behavior in terms of the mean or the variability in the Asian monsoon. One of the things that comes out is, as sort of expected, you're getting a mix of more failures from the guidelines. And so this comes in terms of the effects of their control. And then we can also see here, as part of this, we did a logistic regression that allowed us to figure out what are the controlling factors. So it turns out the two major factors that are controlling flood-based failures are changes in mean flow and changes in interannual variability. Uh, likewise, we can take that logistic regression and we can get a sense or contour that sense of a probability that a solution is successful in any of these worlds. And so you have this sort of threshold and this allows us, we have a, a linear cut feature where we can sort of cut where in this space successes reside. And so if we think about that, we can solidify that. And so you have this sort of pink zone where you have a high likelihood of failure and a blue zone where you have a high likelihood of success in meeting this specific criterion where you're meeting your freeboard criterion for flood. Now, if we look at a uh, criterion for hydropower, this is a different ministry than the ministry that's controlling flood. Now you have a similar set of effects, but one of the interesting things is even though you have the same controlling features, and this explains why you have the conflict in the objectives. You have, regions are opposite of each other. So in essence, where you succeed in hydropower, you fail in flooding. We can do the same for agricultural deficits. Here, the factors that emerged as being important are agricultural demand and potentially other demands. 
for these thresholds. And in each of these thresholds is an elicited interaction with the multiple ministries and stakeholders. So one of the things that we can think about is a safe operating space, the blue versus pink. The triangular regions are the result of our logistic regression classification of failures and success. And one of the questions is, we took 20 perturbation experiments of initial conditions for 20 different climate models that each were doing multiple representative concentration pathways from the utopian 2.6 climate scenario down to the 8.5. And where you see the white dot here, this is actually where the status quo system exists. And so if we move through this and we put this into a temporal context, one of the things that you see is that the system is right at the edge, even in the EMO DPS solution, uh, and out. So in essence, the system is already out of the failure space uh, or the safe operating space uh, with the guidelines. And this is something that actually they were already sort of familiar with in but not exactly clear on why it was happening because several small events uh, were leading to larger outcomes than what they had anticipated as they implemented the control rules. And the other thing I should highlight is that the control rules that they were implementing were iteratively formulated over the course of several years uh, through a mix of simulation and real system experiment and are still evolving. So one of the questions is why? Why are the different policies behaving a certain way? And one of the things that we wanted to show is the adaptivity and the information feedbacks are critical in this time varying control context for the So one of the things that we did is that we did a time varying uncertainty analysis. So we simulated at the hourly level a thousand years um, through our stochastic sampling. And we calculate first order Taylor series approximation of the variance prescribed in this. So what we're basically asking is what is the sensitivity of releases at each reservoir to the inputs in the policy? So as you change the inputs in the policy, how much does that actually change? And one of the things is what are the dominant sources of information that are really affecting the, the operations? And as you see here in this variance decomposition, we take our policy, and in this case, we can do an analytic derivative, and we can simulate through in a stochastic thousand-year sense what's happening in terms of the variance. Uh, and for the guidelines, we use central differencing to make sure that we could actually get similar analog results. Now in this case, we have all the data that we need. For example, this is the covariance between the level at Hanoi as an input, this is your forecast. And then this is the storage state at Hoi Bin. And so you have that information. Likewise, as we move through this, we can think about the first order effects. So the effects of an input by itself, we can think about uh, second order effects of inputs in terms of how they affect releases in the system. And uh, in this particular case, we neglected higher order effects. The other thing that is worth explaining is that you can get negative uh, interactions here. And just to sort of explain that, when we're thinking about second order effects, if you have covariance that's positive, greater than zero, but you have sort of your releases doing the opposite behavior. So this is two different opposites increasing and decreasing. In this case, you can get a negative interaction. Likewise, if you have an anti-correlation, so covariance is less than zero, but you have the effects are basically the same in your release space. The key point here though is just to sort of the narrative. So one of the things you have here is you have the months of the year. So this is your operational year. These are the inputs to your control policy. So the storage state at Son Ma, the storage state at current time in Hoi Bin, et cetera. This is your forecast. And then interactions. And this is the portion of variance in your releases. And what we're looking at here is a specific preference. Your best hydropower policy. This is assumes that you don't care about anything and you're just trying to maximize your production of hydropower. And so this is uh, 
the sensitivity of the releases at Hoi Bin subject to maximizing hydropower. There are a few interesting things that you can see here. One is that in many parts of the year, Hoi Bin, the state of the storage itself in the prior period is the dominant uh, factor that drives the, the policy control. One of the other interesting things here is that this is not a risk averse solution in terms of thinking about flooding. What happens is it uses one of the smaller reservoirs, storages, to control floods. So you have a shift and the largest reservoir, Hoi Bin, is used to maintain storages and maximize hydropower. So you've transferred out control to a smaller reservoir and in a sense you're accumulating structural risk. And one of the interesting things just to highlight, this is for one extreme event. This is for a hundred year flood event. And this is how we unfolded this. So this is a, a year, so where you have a 1% worst case flood and we decompose that year. We could look at a different kind of year. We could look at a year where you had that 1% worst case of hydropower production. What you see is you get a very different signature in that year of the information and in its use. This highlights the path dependency in the system and the lack of decomposability in the dynamics of the control. Likewise, you can see what it looks like in a worst case year for deficit. The intent here is for you not to understand every single thing, but is the decompositions that we typically use in these systems assume sort of across wet period, dry period, and then different components of the reservoirs when in fact they're highly interdependent, they're specific to extreme context and specific to preference. So if we shift and think about, we wanna be risk averse and shift from maximizing hydropower to our best flood policy, you have a fundamentally different structure of what's controlling your potential uh, actions in each of your time periods. And particularly when you look at a, a bad flood year, a bad hydropower production year, and a bad agricultural year, this is very different than the prior signature. And one of the other things that is a big discussion point is the degree of foresight and skill in our forecast models. And you can see here, there is a tremendous amount of dependence on our skill for, as forecasting. So mistakes here could have significant effects in terms of the, the risks and the realized sort of viability of the control in terms of really protecting human life and property. Compromise is non-trivial. So uh, one, there really isn't a thing of a, a simple knee region compromise in this. There are strong sort of conceptual concerns and each of the control policies potentially have a very different, non-separable, highly interdependent dynamic of what's controlling each release in each period. And what you see here is as you try to really compromise across your interests, you have a mix and it sort of makes sense. Each of the signals for the individual objectives is now starting to mix. And you have this really complex multi-reservoir forecast driven, uh, non-decomposable, highly path dependent, highly event context driven control. Now, unfortunately, when we look at this for uh, their actual guidelines, this is the same diagram where we're trying to do the decomposition across a bad flood year, a bad hydropower production year, and a bad agricultural year for the actual guidelines. So those guidelines were formulated with the decomposition and with inputs with the intent of structuring right coordinated information. The intent is to maximize the available information to make good choices. Unfortunately, the artifact is that those guidelines were really only sensitive to hoi bin storage. If we think about this, there are whole periods where there really is no signal in the control. And this starts to make sense why the guidelines are right at the edge of not protecting at the 100 year flood event. So as we move through this, we're thinking also in terms of are these reservoirs coordinating? So without getting lost here, these are all the releases for the EMO DPS compromise policy. And the short take home point of this is yes, they're highly coordinated within this reinforced learning based policy. Now, one of the challenges here, this policy, these policies are fundamentally simpler in terms of 
their abstracted ability to be used in practice. You're talking about maybe 30 lines of code versus a thousand lines of code. But that being said, they're harder to understand because they're contextually state dependent. They, they change significantly. And this becomes an institutional construct. So one of the things that is a lesson here is that the Vietnamese control rule baseline, so what they're using operationally, it's easy to understand the if then else logic and the decomposition that's employed. It's not easy to understand the effects of that in the stochastic output space. And in a lot of socio-environmental systems, we substitute our understanding for the, the rule form for an understanding of the consequence. And in this case, what you see here are large periods where there's no coordination and you don't get a lot of cross-reservoir coordination or interaction. And in some cases, you have no signal whatsoever. So when we think about this within the context of broader climate assessments and our intent in transitioning and trying to think about um, state action consequence feedbacks and exploring them, there's a few things in terms of thinking about how we should model and understand these systems. Simple, discrete, if-then-else based human system abstractions, one, are extraordinarily nonlinear. Um, they can be interpretable from a policy or institutional context, but what they're actually doing in the state dynamics may be extremely difficult, and often you're not going to capture failure modes. One of the other things is common in these sorts of uh, applications is, especially for smaller scale decision making, where you start getting into municipalities and that don't have the resources of a, a national government, is they take deterministic output for climate models, they deterministically downscale that, and then they run that through their, their hydrologic models and their operational models. And then they try to, to think about what potentially uh, risks they face, but the, the problem with this is that when you fit these models to historical conditions, those historical conditions are limited, one, because they're not uh, long observation records generally, so even the observations are a poor representation of the system's internal variability, and then two, the fundamental thermodynamics and dynamics and mechanisms in the systems, as well as institutional and sort of human demand, are changing dramatically. Often they're changing at a rate that's faster than the ability of the institutions managing them are able to change. And so you're moving into this extrapolation problem where exploratory modeling and broadening the envelope of the states of the world where you expose the system and sort of creativity and the actions that you consider is critical. Another is poor abstractions of sequential decision making. So in this case, it's non-trivial to think about hourly decision making across uh, a thousand or a hundred thousand years. The computational demands of this are non-trivial. Um, our general approaches for tackling that is usually uh, driving simplifications in the way we simulate the model that they themselves can't be actually uh, employed in these types of applications because they, they undercut our understanding of the actual risk. Thinking about sectoral and institutional conflict, different ministries, different institutions that have different objectives, and then often not having state aware or strong information feedbacks in the types of actions that are being taken. And as a caveat in our own modeling, um, we're assuming a set of human institutions, land right, competition, and economic context here that if those change, and an example is, what if the Vietnamese actually change their policy to make room for the river, for example, to allow flooding in certain segments of uh, their country to reduce the tension down at Hanoi, similar to, for example, what the Dutch have been doing for decades that would change the entire sort of institutional and state context of this. And so in these systems, we have to think about our tools because we lack a uh, strong causality mapping. And this idea of hysteresis, there's a tremendous amount of uniqueness and path dependence in terms of the control, the actions you take and the specific type of extreme uh, that you're facing that may transition to a very different type of extreme. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank the 
Texas Advanced Supercomputing Center for providing the copious amount of computational support that we had over the years. Um, this work was supported by the National Science Foundation as part of a climate risk uh, sustainability research network. And again, I wanna thank my co-authors, my former PhD, uh, Julie Quinn, and my Polytechnico de Milano collaborators, Matteo Giuliani and Andre. And with that, I would be happy to, to take questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Patrick, for this exciting talk about uh, a really complex real world problem. Um, let me read a few questions to you. Uh, one question that came up is, what kind of simulation did you use? Was it a system dynamic simulation or discrete event simulation or something else? This was a continuous in time simulation, systems dynamics abstraction, where we had, uh, we built stochastic uh, time series for the, the, the river inflows. And so, and we accounted for the autocorrelation in time and space of the system. Um, and then as you move down through the simulation, we actually had an emulator of the hydraulics at Hanoi. Um, so it was a mix, but it was systems dynamics driven and continuous in time. Okay. Then I have some questions about the policies that you obtained uh, through your approach. Um, one question here is whether they, the policies that you generated are a lot more complicated than the original policies that they had uh, designed? That's an excellent question, right? And I think this is a question that not just in this example, I think there's gonna be a a question of how much do we sort of collaborate in our joint cognitive systems of human and computer. So I'll answer from a variety of perspectives. Their guidelines were over a thousand lines of C code. Our policies were less than typically 30 lines of code. Um, their policy is an if then else decomposition where it's very clear that you're assuming wet season, dry season, uh, they're more nebulous in discretion, and that's where it's fully human. Um, but when you implement both of them, implemented in a simulation approach, right? You take your current state of the system and you simulate the candidate release action. So in that regard, they're very similar. Where the two policies forms, their guidelines and our approach, Ours are harder to understand in terms of the, the structure of the actions, in terms of the, the input side, um, but those are harder to understand. There was a tremendous lack of action in the output space. So this idea, understanding the form of a rule does not understand its effect in the dynamics. Um, and part of the reason we did this mapping of what's controlling in each period uh, was to sort of open up the black box of our rule system. So in short, both forms have different sort of uh, degrees of complexity. I would argue that uh, if you're thinking about minimum defining length and code form, ours are much simpler. Um, from an institutional argument though, if you're gonna go to a court and you're gonna try to show what a reservoir's operation is, the open loop form of theirs is simpler to understand but the closed loop version of ours makes more sense for a stochastic dynamic system. Okay. Um, then there's the question of whether this system that you have designed is actually applied in Vietnam now. And if so, who is actually acting on it? So this is one of the things that I was sort of talking about towards the end, which is a challenge. So over the course of our experiments and up through um, the results that you see here, there was a lot of interaction between particularly the Milano um, folks and the ministries in Vietnam. So, and, and in formulating the Vietnamese version of the guidelines. So there was a lot of interaction, but the implementation of our current rules is not currently happening. Um, there is some discussion about transitioning. Um, and the potential for use. There are examples in other systems where uh, this type of closed loop feedback system is being implemented. 
Um, but there's a tension right now. And the other thing that is really a huge uncertainty is that the Vietnamese ministries changed substantially. There was a shift on the, the political front. And so a lot of ministerial representatives changed over the course and towards the end of the project. So I would say we're at the stage now where we've shown recommendations, but implementation is not there. Although I think the opportunity is there and there is interest in, in other places around the world and within the United States, we are moving closer to direct implementation with this type of control or other infrastructure investment sorts of rule systems. Okay, but if the mechanism would be implemented, um, would this be completely automatic or would uh, people monitor it and act on it or how, how exactly would it work in practice? Yeah, I don't, I mean, the intent is that you could tw move towards an automatic approach. But in these socio-environmental systems, there's a lot of components in that system that have to be acted. So I think you could automate the release. My suspicion is, and where things like this, for an example, Lake Como in Italy is another place, is that it would be sort of human and computer. So you would be generating these control recommendations uh, and then the operators would look at the, the recommendations, contextualize, simulate, test, uh, I think at the hourly level, there would be some level of automation, but I think as you move over days to weeks, the humans would probably be thinking about adjusting uh, or shifting. And you can see this in a lot of areas where um, reinforcement learning or AI-based strategic um, recommendations are sort of being filtered through the human experts. Um, and I would say that's what's going to happen in these types of systems as well. And I think there's a tension, in, particularly in the, the world of water, where uh, there's this discomfort, where these types of automated approaches are starting to, to go beyond human competitive. So they're fairly frequently uh, outperforming uh, the traditional rule forms that we've been using. And I don't think institutionally uh, or even necessarily um, socially, folks have fully wrapped their brains around where we how we want to shape these systems. Okay. Um, so then maybe a question about the objectives. Uh, how many objectives are modeled and are there maybe additional objectives that you uh, ignored and deliberately said that we can't consider those anymore? Um, this is uh, a key point. So we modeled in this case, maximizing hydropower revenue we also minimizing the flood risk at Hanoi. We also wanted to minimize the supply deficit for agriculture. Um, so if we're thinking about those, there are definitely other objectives that could have been included. We, in this, did not analyze the potential for sea level rise and from the Delta side of this problem, sort of the, the backflow problem. Um, there could be ecological objectives. And so um, this question is really at the heart of these kinds of problems. Uh, defining the problem is the ultimate uncertainty. And so there is a myopia by definition. And I think, yes, there are definitely objectives that we uh, just through the pragmatics and interactions and preferences of the stakeholders uh, ignored. Um, and I think if we opened it up, we probably would change things. I think thinking about the, the problem formulation process and closing that through implementation as a, a directed iterative and deliberative learning process is critical uh, to sort of deal with the fact that we have these conceptual uncertainties in our problem formulations. Okay. Uh, can you give uh, a sense of how many Pareto optimal solutions were created and how many you actually then looked at in more detail? Um, we were typically looking at the range of 300 to 500 and we analyzed them all. Um, we didn't necessarily present all of them to the, the stakeholders, but the intent was to have provenance of concept. Um, and so by that, I mean that if you're sort of talking about specific representative solutions like uh, maximizing uh, flood protection or maximizing hydropower. 
one of the things is that a lot of stakeholders would say that something was their primary objective or their sole interest, but when you would show the dynamics of the system under that, um, they'd say, well, that can't be done, or that's not appropriate, or the dynamics don't make sense, or that condition isn't being met. And so having the, the fallback where we could actually, um, especially in sort of the, the meetings where you're trying to deliberate on what's preferred or thinking of compromise, having these pre-computed stochastic analyses was quite helpful because you could fall back and you could show how that changed across the Pareto set. Um, and often one of the things that was sort of interesting and it's been some, something I've seen frequently, um, stakeholders aren't interested in one solution. They're actually interested in sort of the behavior across the set and then having sort of a, a portfolio of options that they can explain. So one of the comments was that we don't want a magic dart because it may be myopic or not encompass some of the things we care about. We'd rather have uh, a diverse set of options that we can explain, even if it's not one that we can um, implement or want to implement. If it's, for example, solely producing hydropower, it might create a counterfactual in terms of uh, claims of preference, but then when they look at it, they actually don't want to maximize hydropower, if that made sense. So we analyzed all of them. Okay. Um, then there's a suggestion. Uh, if, you, if you want to help people uh, implement, would it be feasible to give decision makers a real-time what-if scenario system so that they can play around with it and find out what happens if they, if they overwrite the system? Yes. 100% yes. And then, in fact, one of my current projects is developing a serious gaming framework just like that for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for the major infrastructure systems. Um, and they want to game it just to get an understanding and have that. And, and in many ways, sort of my prior answer about how this would be used, I think having this as sort of that serious gaming framework or that simulation context where they can really look across worlds, across assumptions, across operational choice, um, and thinking about that real-time context, uh, I think it would be useful. I think there's some computational uh, challenges there and conceptual challenges, but I think those are going to be critical to realizing the success of this type of work. So yeah, I fully agree. I think that's a great suggestion. Okay. Uh, have you thought about longer term climate issues, such as the amount or timing of the monsoon rainfall? Yeah, so in this, we specifically built um, a stochastic abstraction and changing in the statistical behaviors, uh, both in terms of timing and magnitude of flood and drought. And so in our stochastic modeling, for example, um, some of this is we could actually draw out, uh, and we did 100,000 different temporal sequences of change. And then the other thing that we did is that we collaborated with folks at Penn State University as part of our uh, sustainability research network, where we used an ensemble of 20 different cl climate models. And then for each of those models, perturbation experiments for their initial conditions. And so we had 400 uh, ensemble members across scenarios and across climate models to look at um, the way that the monsoon is changing. And that was in the image that I showed where you have the climate projection and the safe operating space. We used our stochastic modeling and the global climate modeling to, to contextualize the potential for change. And in our other work, uh, we do a lot uh, with the, the global climate modeling community. Okay. Um, clearly, you highlighted the importance of sensitivity analysis to understand the uncertain parameters. Um, is there an argument for considering this within the policy optimization rather than post-optimization? Potentially, yes. Uh, I think uh, specifically if you're looking for feedbacks that aren't occurring, um, uh, or thinking about your policy complexity. So in the limit, uh, the number of inputs and the number of outputs affect the sort of the basis family of policy representation. Uh, 
So uh, there's a variety of things that you could do. You could simplify the policies with reduced inputs. In this case, we kept the form as close uh, as possible to what the Vietnamese uh, baseline was using um, and iterative. But when we do this generally, uh, thinking about the form and function, you can also think about like neural evolution and some of the other uh, techniques thinking about the topology space of the policies themselves, right? And then thinking about how you would internalize uh, sensitivity insights. I think the question is, how general are the sensitivity techniques if you're doing it online uh, as you're finding the policies uh, and some of the computational side, but I think uh, it could be fr fruitful. Okay, maybe one last question because I'm aware that you have to leave soon to do some teaching. Um, so there's one uh, person who says she's been on sponsored projects like this and finds that users uh, often are not inclined to change to a new method. Um, what do you do to help encourage them to adopt the change to their systems? Um, so I don't by any means want to present the face that we've always been successful in this. So I've been at this at 20 years. Um, there's a, a couple of things that I, I see where successes have happened. Um, one is you build credibility with the users that you're abstracting their systems well and you have a sense. Um, building the relevance of the scientific work, so making sure that the work isn't for your journal paper but is for the system, um, and thinking about the, the relevance to the questions at hand and sort of the, the context of their choices matters. And then the biggest one for us has been the legitimacy of the communication in terms of how do you actually institute change within the institutional context of the system, and a lot of that is building internal relationships, trust, um, and really understanding either the operational or governance sort of side of the problem. And often we will um, work with social scientists and communicators and others, um, but there's not really a shortcut that I've seen. It's required multi-year relationships, building of trust um, and answering very direct questions. Um, and then the other side is that there's sort of a psychological side. So if you can show that the new approach is better in all things that the, the key decision makers care about and that they're in a dominated space in terms of the status quo and that you can move them out of that dominated space, um, you sort of trigger the loss aversion and uh, overcome some of the status quo inertia. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, for again this exciting talk and uh, and all your answering of the questions. Uh, I know you have to leave so um, yeah uh, hope uh, we, we see each other soon at some other occasion face to face. It was really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much and thank you uh, so much. Have a good day. Thank you all.